Uh, I'm Itzik Ren. I'm the director of the Institute. And it's a great pleasure to have you here and to see a program that is trilingual and not bilingual. Um, the Institute was founded in 1975 as a, uh, as a safe haven for scholars who wish to pursue their research in, um, in a calm environment without the burden of teaching and uh, without the burden of teaching and uh, uh, administrative work. Um, and the model, of course, was the Institute in Princeton that was founded in 1930, um, basically to host Einstein. So um, nobody could tell that uh, when the Institute was founded in the 1930s, it, um, it will become uh, a refuge place for all the scholars who escaped um, a fascist and, and uh, a Nazi uh, Europe and actually hosted most of, uh, of the brilliant minds that escaped Europe, Jews and non-Jews, and this Institute actually inaugurated the academic life in America and, and boosted the university system in Northern America. So um, our institute is following this model. And since uh, uh, the institute was founded, we hosted more, more than uh, 150 research groups in all fields, in all disciplines, uh, more than uh, uh, 1,200 scholars. Um, we're hosting uh, six advanced school for postgraduate students every year in mathematics, economics, engineering, computer science, physics, and the humanities. And uh, numerous conferences, and your conference is, is one of the conferences that we are happy to host here. So I wish you a pleasant conference and a fruitful group fruitful conference and enjoy your stay around in Jerusalem and in the Institute uh, for Advanced Studies. Thank you. As brachot, I want to... It's okay. We don't need... <laughs> it's just no, uh, I want to congratulate our, our guest, uh, uh, keynote speaker, and uh, all other speakers. Uh, we are three, three bodies that organize this uh, conference, uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, uh, Walter Liebach uh, Institute in Tel Aviv University that Amal Jamal is heading, Professor Amal Jamal, and the School for Peace, uh, uh, which is located at Neve Shalom Wachat Salam, the only community in Israel where Jews and Palestinians uh, decided to live together uh, in peace and in equality. And inside we have an institution that is the main outreach of the community elsewhere uh, to work with Jews and Palestinians from within Israel and also across the border uh, with Palestinians from uh, Palestine or the occupied territories, uh, and to train them to be change agents in our society for peace and equality. Uh, we thought about the idea to Although it's the darkest days, we can say uh, uh, we have uh, in uh, the uh, situation that is uh, uh, neglecting or uh, opposing democracy and equality, and to dream about constitutions maybe one day in this country uh, that will be equal and will uh, uh, share this uh, country between the two people uh, living here uh, and give uh, equal rights uh, for each group and each individual. And, uh, but nevertheless, we, we thought it's uh, an answer for the uh, national law that uh, was just uh, constituted uh, a year ago, and uh, we think we should bring the issue to the surface and to talk about it and to change 
So we will have another society. So I'm happy to see you all. And we hope tomorrow with <laughs> improving weather, we will have more, even more people. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I would like to start thanking uh, the Israel uh, Institute for Advanced Studies for hosting this uh, conference, for uh, uh, contributing to its uh, uh, inauguration. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Nava and Amir Fakhouri from the uh, Nabe Shalom School of, uh, for Peace uh, for the cooperation to uh, uh, complete uh, a very uh, impressive and wonderful team of people that will be speaking in this conference. Uh, I'm Amal Jamal from the Walter Liebach Institute uh, at Tel Aviv University, which uh, deals with uh, Jewish-Arab uh, relations uh, inside Israel and uh, in the region. And uh, the idea of the conference, as Nava said, came about uh, few months ago, even before the nation state law passed in the Knesset uh, last summer, uh, I think that the trend uh, taking place in, in Israel, the wave of legislation taking place in the Knesset that took place in the Knesset and is expected to continue after the next elections uh, is uh, very troubling, uh, very worrying, and that's what made us uh, think that uh, speaking about uh, constitutionalism, speaking about uh, the importance and placing constitutions in, uh, uh, in nation states, especially the type of Israel, is very central, very important. And to put Israel in, uh, in a comparative, comparative perspective uh, becomes uh, a demand in order to understand that what's going on in this country is not uh, 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 an exceptional a process, but still very uh, troubling and has to be taken care of uh, since uh, uh, the promise, uh, something I'll be elaborating about uh, uh, tomorrow, the promise of the uh, Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel back in 1948 left a door open for a civic uh, entity, for civic equality. Uh, it made a clear call for uh, different types of citizens to come and share the power in the state and be equal citizens, something that left uh, some hope for the future. And here comes the nation state law as part of the constitutional process taking place since 1958 until today uh, uh, and close the door on such a hope. Uh, I hope that, that uh, the next government will take that uh, will take a, a serious stand and change the trend uh, uh, as a result of uh, public uh, pressure, whether from inside Israel or from uh, abroad. Uh, but I will leave, uh, you know, my my contribution for my talk tomorrow. I would like to uh, uh, welcome uh, one of the uh, most well-known if not the well-known, uh, the best-known scholar in constitution, comparative constitutionalism and constitutional identity, uh, Professor uh, Gary Jeffrey uh, Jacobson from uh, uh, Texas University at Austin. Uh, uh, Gary made uh, us very happy when he agreed to come a long way from Austin, Texas, uh, to share with us his thoughts about what's going on uh, in Israel from his uh, point of view. Uh, somebody who dealt with Israel extensively in the past uh, comes very often here and knows what's going on. Uh, uh, Gary is uh, ex uh, Malcolm McDonald uh, Chair in Constitutional and Comparative uh, 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 Law at the University of uh, Texas at Austin, Department of Government. Government. His area of uh, uh, specialization is comparative constitutionalism, constitutional theory, and constitutional uh, process. He wrote extensively on these topics, and uh, he made a very serious contribution to the to constitutional theory and comparative consti constitutionalism. I'm going to mention uh, only a few of his publications in order to leave the time for him to share his thoughts with us. Uh, uh, he published uh, several books uh, that are very important, as said. 
uh, I'm going to uh, start with uh, the best I know, which is not the last necessarily, uh, but he considers also one of the uh, one of the highlights of his uh, of his uh, academic career, the Wheel of Law, India's Secularism in Comparative Constitutional Context, uh, came out back in 2003 with Princeton University Press. 2010, he published a book uh, entitled Constitutional Identity, uh, Harvard University Press, and uh, 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 an upcoming book with uh, a colleague uh, who is attending this conference and speaking in it, Yaniv uh, Rosnai, they are publishing together uh, an important book on constitutional revolution that is supposed to come out uh, with Yale University Press, uh, hopefully 2019, right? Uh, so I, I really welcome Gary here and thank him very much again for uh, uh, coming uh, a long way to share uh, with us his thoughts. I would like to introduce uh, also uh, another member of the Jacobson family uh, who, who, <laughs> who is also here and going to respond to Gary's talk, uh, uh, Alex uh, Jacobson, Professor Alex uh, Jacobson from uh, the History uh, Department at the Hebrew University, uh, who published or co authored uh, a book with Amnon Rubinstein, uh, a, ve a very well known uh, scholar in, in Israel. Uh, the title of the book, Israel and the Family of Nations, Jewish Nation State and Human Rights. Uh, as he told me, shared with me before, uh, uh, Alex is, is uh, uh, you know, his specialization has to, to do with, uh, uh, w with the time of, uh, uh, of the Middle Ages. And, uh, 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 but still, he, uh, he can't but relate to, the, uh, to current affairs. He has been sharing with us his thoughts in, uh, on, on the pages of Haaretz for a long time, publishing very intriguing uh, uh, op-ads on uh, current affairs. And his take on the nation-state law is very interesting. Uh, his thoughts about Israel is uh, thought-provoking, and I thank him very much also for uh, his willingness to come and respond to Gary's talk. Uh, so welcome with me, please, Gary uh, Jacobson, to give his uh, keynote speech for this conference. Thank you very much, and welcome. Yes, thank you for that very kind introduction. It is indeed a big day for Jacobson. <laughs> Let me just make sure this is, this is working. working. <laughs> it has water. This is a strange opening. Yes. Right. Okay. So this is my eighth trip to Israel. Visit Three in 1988 was my longest when I came to do research for a book, Apple of Gold. It was a trip highlighted by lengthy interviews with some of the giants in Israeli jurisprudence, three of whom are no longer with us, Shimon Agranat, Chaim Kohn, Moshe Landau, and another, Aharon Barak, who continues to inspire and provoke us with his reflections on law and life. It was also a humbling experience, as I was made painfully aware when David Kretschmer greeted me with the assurance that my linguistic limitations would prevent me from writing anything of real merit. Years later, he generously allowed as how he might have underestimated me, but I really can't argue with something that is also implicit in his underlying premise which is also to be found in Confucius. He who speaks without modesty will find it difficult to make his words good. So let me begin this talk by stating the obvious. There are people in this room, probably the vast majority, whose grasp of the issues related to this controversial basic law is a, that is the focus of this conference, no doubt far exceeds my own. There's very little that I could add to what you already know about the relevant factual record or the pros and cons that have accrued with respect 
to the merits of the law. And so I won't spend much time elaborating on these matters, since anything I might add is something that those with a more intimate connection with the issue no doubt already know. What I will do, and I take it this is the reason that I'm here, is offer some perspective on the basic law as it relates to the vexed question of constitutional identity. As you know, the judicial invalidation of constitutional amendments on the basis of their alleged incompatibility with the substantive commitments of the extant constitution is no longer an imaginary option. Increasingly, courts around the world have availed themselves of this practice, and often when they do so, or threaten to do so, they invoke constitutional identity to justify what they have done. This is especially true in India and Germany, the two places where the jurisprudence of the unconstitutional constitutional amendment has advanced the furthest. Now, the constitutional reality in these countries is, of course, very different from what you have here in Israel. These differences alone might lead one to reject the identity-based reasoning of the courts that have embraced what must be considered the most extreme example of judicial activism. My approach today will not, for the most part, go down this road. Rather, I want to present an understanding of the concept of constitutional identity that transcends the comparative distinctions that are plain to see. In other words, wherever constitutional identity is used for the purpose of declaring a constitutional provision unconstitutional, those doing so should confront some realities about the concept that need to be factored into decision making before they follow through on their inclinations. Now at the outset, I should point out that a few years ago I offered some thoughts on the desirability of passing a basic law to clarify the status of Israeli constitutional identity. I was one of a number of people asked by Ruth Gavison for input on the report she was preparing for Justice Minister Livni. Some of what I said then can serve as a backdrop for my remarks today. The question then that was put to me was whether Israel should seek to give additional constitutional entrenchment and elaboration to its identity as Jewish and democratic. But my answer to this question began with another question. What does it mean to entrench a constitutional identity? If it is to suggest that by embedding the substance of Israeli identity in wording that will, through its codification, acquire a fixed and unalterable meaning, I worried that the initiative was predicated on an erroneous assumption, that a constitutional identity is something that can be captured and preserved within the boundaries of a text. This is not the case. Thus, even in polities where identity is a less fraught phenomenon, in the sense that its content reveals a greater coherence than one finds in Israel, meticulous and comprehensive articulation of meaning has typically not been an objective of constitutional draftsmanship. The American Constitution, for example, is replete with majestic generalities, yet their specific constitutional articulation relies as much, if not more, on the political process, a process that includes the judiciary, as it does on what is entrenched in the document. Constitutional identity is a dynamic phenomenon whose parameters are not delineated by the textual confines of a document. The point I was making was influenced by what was occurring in Europe. As the reach and authority of the EU had expanded in the aftermath of Maastricht and Lisbon, high courts in the member states, notably the German court, increasingly found themselves in a defensive posture, pressured from within and without to preserve a local constitutional identity against a potentially overbearing central administration. 
The court, it was said, must not let the goal of European integration dilute or displace a distinctive constitutional identity that was entrenched in several provisions of the basic law. These provisions, notably the dignity guarantee, possess a historically weighty meaning, but one that arguably can only acquire constitutional significance through institutional engagement within the broader European community. Identity, again, is not a fixed thing. What specific iteration it assumes will or should rely to some extent on the developing interactive constitutional politics on the European continent. The historical experience of member states sets limits to the mutability of constitutional identity, but the attempt to entrench specific inscribed meanings to a construction that might achieve consensus on only the most general of expressions does not take seriously enough the dynamic qualities of identity. Among the options for Israel was to do nothing, and that is where I came out. I supported the idea of adopting a formal constitutional document that leaves the current standing of creedal expression in its perfunctory condition. Now, admittedly, a do-nothing response is rarely appealing, particularly when the status quo, as in this instance, lacked passionate defenders. While it was Jewish dissatisfaction with the then existing arrangements that formed the backdrop to the Livni Initiative, it could hardly be said of secular Democrats, Jewish and Arab, that they represented an Israeli constituency at peace with the status quo. Indeed, the so-called status quo agreement was for many a continuing reproach to egalitarian values. As I pointed out, to incorporate language about the status of religious law in constitutional form would place Israel in a group of 21 nations whose constitutions do precisely that. Of these 21 nations, all but one address this status as it pertains to Islam. And so I concluded, given the ongoing realities of Israel's divided society, both political and demographic, might not a continuation of the unresolved tension in Israeli constitutional identity be the safest path to pursue? Was there not good reason to suppose that the potential for creative ambiguity might be a better option than one that would achieve a more precise articulation of the twofold commitments of the regime? Even in the United States, where constitutional identity was at best an aspirational yearning, credo provisions and bills of rights were only lightly touched in the original document. And it took a bloody civil war before there was any mention of equality. On the other hand, the very thinness of the Constitution allowed a Lincoln, and much later a King, to push a redemptive politics that made it more likely for the Constitution to make good on a promissory note that had not been included in the constitutional text. Of course, that was not the option pursued by the Knesset. While not explicitly repudiating the democratic aspirations in the Declaration of Independence and other places, the new basic law's silence about this commitment was widely heard as an unmistakable abandonment. And so began the heated debate. Again, this is all familiar to you. The law's omissions meant that the balance between Jewish and democratic values was no longer an operative reality. What had occurred, critics said, was nothing short of a refounding of the state, an assault upon its secular identity. Nonsense, said the, Jew, the justice minister. There is nothing revolutionary in this specific law. It contains, she claimed, values that the state was founded on values of national identity. Her supporters agreed, portraying the law as a modest measure, 
that could be seen as controversial only in Israel. What it does is provide long overdue clarification for the subject of Israel, nas Israeli national identity. They saw the clarification as important for a multitude of constituencies at home and abroad, but in particular for the judges on the Supreme Court whose rulings demonstrate that they, more than anyone else, require instruction about the fundamental principles of the regime. As one defender of the law put it, the nation state law is intended to direct the Supreme Court away from post-Zionism, back to the days when it was clear that the needs of the Zionist project take precedence over anything, or as they might say, make Israel great again. The response to such a dec declaration corresponds with what I hear in the US when our bloviator in chief makes similar pronouncements. Stop encouraging a culture war. All this nation state law does is exacerbate divisions in society to the detriment of everyone, but especially to vulnerable minorities who need not be confronted with an official reminder of what they already know that special guarantees are unnecessary to ensure the rights and privileges of a majority. As one critic of the basic law compellingly argued, a key intent of the law is not merely to shift the balance of power away from democracy as part of the ongoing culture war, but even more grimly to signal to the Arab population of Israel that it is and will remain practically and legally subordinate to the Jews in the state of Israel. Your prime minister's recent comment that, quote, Israel is the nation state not of all its citizens, but only of the Jewish people, underscores the ominous implications of the enactment. With the placement of the controversy on the docket of the judiciary, we're now in a position to confront directly the question of constitutional identity. My approach will be to address this conundrum by way of the petition submitted to the Supreme Court by Adala, where we encounter a number of passionate and well-reasoned arguments concerning the merits, or lack thereof, of the nation state of the Jewish people basic law. It is, however, the petition's case for judicial nullification of the law that will be my specific focus. Given the emphasis of the Adala argument on Israeli constitutional identity, I take it as an invitation to share with you my thoughts on the uses and abuses of this concept for the exercise of what is the most aggressive form of judicial power. To be clear, what I'm not doing is assessing the full range of considerations that a court should tackle before deciding whether to invalidate a law of constitutional standing. For example, I leave to others the perplexing question of whether the manner in which the adoption of the basic law took place can satisfy expectations about what an exercise of constituent power should look like. Clearly, it should matter to the court if what the Knesset did represented something less than a primary expression of popular sovereignty. I'm reminded of what Dr. Ambedkar the James Madison of the Indian Constitution said at his constituent assembly, quote, the constituent assembly in making a constitution has no partisan motive. Beyond securing a good and workable constitution, it has no ax to grind. That is the difference between the constituent assembly and the future parliament. Similarly, I will leave aside the problem of how one should deal with the judicial implications flowing from the relative ease with which formal constitutional change may be brought, with it, brought about within the existing constitutional order. So, in the United States, the failure of the unconstitutional constitutional amendment to gain any traction in the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court is surely connected to the formidable obstacles that must be overcome in order for a proposed textual change 
to culminate in an amendment. Okay, what then of constitutional identity and the nation state of the Jewish people? Adala makes the connection at the start of its petition. Quote, this basic law sets forth and comprises the constitutional identity of the regime. And at the end of its submission, it provides the court with the extrapolation that should dictate the case's outcome. Quote, the act of grounding the constitutional identity of the state in exclusionary principles negates the legitimacy of the entire constitutional and political regime. On both substantive and procedural grounds, the organization finds this codification of a constitutional identity to be blatantly defective and objectionable. Thus, the illegitimacy of the mandated identity is clearly revealed in its appropriation by one ethnic group and its exclusion of other groups on the basis of nationality, religion, and race. And for a whole host of reasons, highlighted by the acts of extreme partisanship and coercive tactics, the petition characterizes its adoption as the result of a coercive constitution-making process. Borrowing from the conceptual toolkit of Bruce Ackerman, the basic law is a constitutional moment in Israeli history, a new beginning which represents the end of any pretense of democratic governance. I have three reactions to this. They pursue different lines of argument, but they all concern the pros and cons of constitutional identity as a legal strategy. My first response requires some metaphorical table setting. A constitutional amendment, or in this case, a basic law, might be thought of as problematic in one of two ways. The change it signifies could subvert the essentials of constitutional governance, at the core of which is the rule of law and the administration of impartial justice. Or, the change it promises could substantially transform or negate a fundamental political commitment of the constitutional order that had been central to the nation's self-understanding. If, if, say, it incorporated within the constitutional text a new commitment to an array of social and economic rights, such a modification could lead to a profoundly alterated constitutional identity. A second possibility may be considered a variation of the first, but it may also stand separately. It's the distinction between constitutionalism and a constitution. So imagine, imagine a table. Recognition of it as such depends on our seeing something about it that conforms to the criteria applicable to that particular object. If we wanted to preserve its identity as a table, we would ensure that its base and horizontal surface remained in place. Preserving its specific identity, it could, for example, be a pool table or a dining room table, means keeping that which makes it one type of table rather than another. For a pool table, we would prevent the removal of its pockets and distinctive felt playing top. But we could also consider ways in which we might modify the identity of the specific table to improve its performance while retaining its essential purpose and character. Global experience suggests that to convince a court to overturn an addition to the Constitution, one needs to show, to show more than that the change will somehow transform the constitutional order into something other than what it presently is. It requires showing that the change threatens the very existence of the constitutional order, that it will cut the legs out from under the table. Even in India, where the court's basic structure doctrine is, as the Adala brief rightly notes, the leading model for how an unconstitutional amendment is to be judicially laid to rest the rare occasions where this has happened have been those when the court defends against a perceived attack on the essentials of constitutional governance. 
including its own independence. In Israel, too, Chief Justice Hyatt has said that for a court to invoke the unconstitutional constitutional amendment option, one must first establish that the target of such an extreme exertion of judicial power represents a threat to what she says are the foundations of the constitutional structure. Of course, the petition before the Supreme Court makes the foundational argument with its assertion that the nation state basic law, quote, does not satisfy the necessary conditions upon which constitutions are created. It thus claims to have met the Hayut criterion. And it finds in an earlier Chief Justice additional support, specifically Justice Barak's opinion in the Mizrahi case where the Constitutional Revolution's principal architect affirmed that Israel is a constitutional democracy. As a result of the adoption of the basic law on human dignity, Israelis, according to Justice Barak, have become part of the human rights revolution that characterizes the second half of the 20th century. I'd be curious to know if this assessment was shared at the time by most Israeli Arabs. The 1992 Basic Law codifies the values of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. But like the current law, it lacks any guarantee of equality. In the Adala brief, the omission of this provision in the recent law is described as unsurprising. Should not the identical omission in the earlier law have been depicted in the same way? My point is simply this. If the new law is to be judicially rendered null and void for shortcomings deemed fatal to the achievement of a legitimate constitutional regime, then would not candor require acknowledging the presence of the same deficiencies prior to the enactment of this latest and most transparent expression of an enduring Zionist commitment? Now it's true, as stated in the petition, that the Israeli constitution is not the same as it was prior to the enactment of the nation state basic law. But how different is it from the actual constitutional order that was in place? What I have in mind here is the distinction very familiar to those who theorize about such things between the actual written document and the facts on the ground functioning constitutional order. The latter may include super statutes, ordinary laws that are effectively constitutive in a deep way, as could be said in the United States about the Social Security Act or the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It might also include institutional norms that have developed over time, such as the legislative filibuster, the practice of which commands greater actual governing authority than what is provided for in the constitutional text. And in Israel, of course, there is the law of return, concerning which David Ben-Gurion famously said, quote, this law does not provide for the state to bestow the right to settle upon the Jew living abroad. It affirms that this right is inherent in him from the very fact of being a Jew. The state does not grant the right of return to the Jews of the diaspora. This right precedes the state. This right builds the state. Its source is to be found in the historic and never broken connection between the Jewish people and the homeland." End quote. How distant, one must ask, is this sentiment from that which is rooted in the expressed language of the new Basic Law's controversial seventh article, which states, as you know, the state views the development of Jewish settlement as a national value and will act to encourage and promote its establishment and consolidation. That the new language will exacerbate what many believe to be an already intolerable situation cannot be ruled out. I would have thought, however, that for those most inclined to expect the worst, they might see in the formal codification of ethnic subordination the natural outgrowth of the well-established precepts of Zionist ideology, ironically perhaps even liberal 
Zionist ideology. To return to my tabular metaphor, the change wrought by the new law is then best understood as an, e as an effort by its supporters to amend the identity of the constitutional order so as to improve its performance while retaining its essential purpose and character. Indeed, true to the etymology of the word, to amend something is to enhance that which already exists, not to engage in an act of reconstitution. So we are left with a dilemma. To the extent that the purpose and character of the basic law is antithetical to constitutionalism, rightly understood, the Supreme Court should give serious consideration to overturning it. But if, if the radical critique of the Israeli state underlying the Adala petition is correct, what is the likelihood that they would do that? After all, implicitly, implicitly it would mean that the justices of that tribunal, like many other Israelis, would have to acknowledge their complicity in rank injustice. My second response imagines that I'm a member of the Supreme Court, who for many of the reasons set out in the petition believes the contested basic law to be a fundamentally flawed and hurtful thing. In evaluating the alleged significance of the identity claim, I would have to consider not only whether the concept has been invoked in a way that is true to its essential meaning, but also if from a strategic point of view, using it to win this battle might prove prohibitively costly in the long run, or even in the short term. Thus my own enlightened views about Israeli identity might not be held by a majority of my colleagues for whom the invitation to confront the constitutional identity question could bring them to a very different conclusion from my own. I might even suspect some of sharing the views of the Minister of Justice, who, as you know, have, has been playing an increasingly active role in the judicial appointment process. As a supporter of the law pointed out, the hope of Israel's current Minister of Justice is that a new generation of Supreme Court judges in whose appointment she will have a hand will be able to use this new law as the basis for, less, for a less progressive judicial agenda. And in thinking about that possibility, I would certainly want to reflect on lessons learned from other places where a high court has invoked constitutional identity to justify its decision in a controversial case, particularly if such an invocation occurred in a place where the political context was one that in some respects was similar to my own. Case in point, Hungary. In December 2016, the Hungarian Constitutional Court upheld the Orban government's refusal to apply the EU's refugee allocation scheme. In doing so, the justices of the government pact judiciary accepted Viktor Orban's argument that his restrictive migration policy fell well within the legitimating ambit of Hungarian constitutional identity. Orban had presented himself as the defender of Europe's Christian civilization, defender against an Islamic invasion, a claim he saw as deeply rooted in the nation's historical constitution. The court, his court, agreed, saying, quote, the protection of constitutional identity shall remain the duty of the constitutional court as long as Hungary is a sovereign state, end quote. In response to the decision, the brazen authoritarian prime minister said, I threw my hat in the air when the Constitutional Court ruled that the government has the right and obligation to stand up for Hungary's constitutional identity. It was, he went on, a great outcome for all those who do not want to see the country occupied, 
end quote. Of course, to see an occupied country, one need only cast a glance at Germany, which for Orban stands as the model of what not to do. What the court did, however, what it did do, was to follow the jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court, which has famously invoked constitutional identity in its own dealings with the European community. But unlike the Hungarian court, which played the identity card to advance lower standards than EU law requires, its German counterpart's concern has focused on the potential threat to the human dignity commitment at the core of its nation's post-war self-understanding. The approaches of the two courts are superficially similar in that the application of constitutional identity in both places is a matter of establishing limits for EU law within the domestic legal environment. Now, as an Israeli judge, I would want to get beyond such surface likenesses to see if there could be a lesson for what confronts us here. And the first thing that might occur to me is that the German court's appeal to constitutional identity has a clear textual basis in certain entrenched provisions of the basic law, often referred to as eternity clauses. In contrast, the Hungarian court's application of the concept is embedded in the historical constitution a deliberately ambiguous invention that offers its interpreters much leeway in selectively recognizing just those renderings of the past that best advance the government's illiberal agenda. It has been pointed out, for example, that Hungary's infamous Nuremberg modeled anti-Jewish laws adopted during the rule of a political leader who was in some ways a precursor to today's ruler could be subsumed within the folds of an imagined constitution. Let me, let me be clear. I'm not predicting that this will happen. But just admitting such a development into the realm of plausibility might give me pause as I consider the invitation to resolve the nation state basic law controversy through the lens of constitutional identity. As part of this consideration, I should, not, should I not factor in what has been called the illiberal bromance between Benjamin Netanyahu and Viktor Orban? In fact, just hours before the passage of the basic law, Netanyahu met with Orban in Jerusalem, calling him a true friend of Israel. As one Israeli commentator put it, they have a keen understanding of their respective nations' histories and have been very adept at using it to their political advantage in domestic politics and increasingly on the global stage. The parallels between the current prime ministers of Israel and Hungary are, are astonishing. So it is perhaps unsurprising that they have forged a strong alliance over the past decade and learned new tricks from each other. As one example, the Israeli Prime Minister's use of the issue of asylum seekers in Israel as a rallying point for the Likud base was a tactic borrowed from Orban's weaponization of Europe's refugee crisis to, bo to boost his own fading popularity in 2015. Or as one Hungarian observer has said, if you want to understand Bibi, look at Orban and vice versa. So maybe the best response to the invitation is to say, be careful what you wish for. The lure of constitutional identity is hard to resist, as much of an appeal is surely related to the politics and emotions of authenticity. Perhaps another trick to be learned from the Hungarian experience is that the historical constitution may resonate to even greater effect in Israel where, after all, the opening line of the nation's founding document reads, the land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Once the identity door is undone, you may be surprised to see who walks through. When it was opened in Hungary, 
the historical Constitution became the destination for those seeking justification for their blinkered view of nationhood. Thus, one should point out in a place where a for I should say this one should point out in a place where a formal written constitution was very much in existence. How much easier to reach this destination where the very absence of such a document has defined the constitutional story of the nation. My third and final response does not require that what entertain doubts or misgivings about the commitments and motivations of the proponents of the law or those to whom its interpretation falls. Unlike the previous argument, it does not ask for a strategic reconsideration of the approach that places constitutional identity at the forefront of the legal assault on the basic law. It does, though, include a troublesome thought that in the pursuit of this approach, its supporters may inadvertently concede more to their adversaries than they should. Specifically, what concerns me in the assertion that the basic law establishes a new constitutional identity for the regime is the implicit acceptance of what the law's promoters say they have accomplished through their enactment of the legislation. They too maintain that all that's necessary to ascertain the content of Israeli constitutional identity is to read the provisions of the law. But the claim from whatever side of the debate it derives misconstrues the concept of constitutional identity. What is so obvious in the very exceptional case of the Israeli constitution is actually endemic to the constitutional condition. Constitutions acquire their identity through experience. This identity exists neither as a discrete object of invention, nor as what we're witnessing in Hungary, a heavily encrusted essence embedded in a society's culture requiring only to be discovered. The Hungarian jurist Anders Sejo had it right when he said well before this current crisis, quote, the constitutional text itself has only limited potential for forging identity. A legally binding document is but a first step on the long and winding road from a political design for collective identity to a socially embedded institution that actually fosters such identity. In my own work, I've argued for withholding judgments about identity until confirming that the codified rules and principles of a document are actually present in the practices of the body politic. So this is what I have in mind. It's hard to think of a constitution that does not include alternative visions or aspirations that may embody different strands within a common historical tradition. A perfectly harmonious constitution is an illusion. A perfectly, I'll emphasize that, a perfectly harmonious constitution is an illusion. Often it is the disharmony internal to a constitutional text that is the driving force behind the nation's evolving constitutional identity. In India, for example, there are two powerful claims on constitutional identity, both firmly rooted in centuries of conflict and contestation. Since independence, one of these claims for a secular composite culture nation has mostly been in ascendance, but the other for a Hindu nation has at times posed a distinct threat to the hegemony of the predominant view. Over time, the identity that has emerged reflects the entrenched reality of both visions. The constitutional text embodies them, as does the history of constitutional construction and interpretation. And along the way, just as we see here in Israel, there have been efforts to reinvent the past 
most notably by those determined to create a history expunged of the truths that complicate their ethno-religious story. In the United States, too, there was reason to think that the codification of the principle of equal treatment in the post-Civil War amendments was a momentous achievement in the development of American constitutional identity, that it marked the ascendance of the universalist strand in the nation's conflicted constitutional tradition. But much like the backlash in Israel to the human dignity law and its interpretation by the Supreme Court, the supporters of the other, more particularistic strand in the tradition did not lack for institutional muscle in their efforts to undermine the constitutive significance of the amendments. The constitutional identity of the text may have changed, but the identity of the constitutional order was only beginning its transformation. To the extent that progress has been made in moving the country toward acceptance of the more enlightened vision, the courts have played a role. But the most important and decisive work was done within the broader political process in legislative bodies and in the streets. How does this speak to the problem posed by the nation state basic law? To me, it suggests that the submission of the constitutional identity argument should be framed in a very particular way. It should proceed with a recognition of the fluidity of the concept, meaning that nothing definitive has been firmly established within the adoption of the basic law. The proponents of the law may very well have intended it to be seen as providing closure to the struggle over Israeli constitutional identity. But why accept their demonstrably incorrect framing of the issue. Instead, the point needs to be made that if the law has a bearing on the identity question, it must be as a component part of an interactive process involving its provisions and those found elsewhere with which they are in tension. The predicate for such an interaction lies in a core rationalization for the new law that it is a necessary counterbalance to the basic laws of the 90s that precipitated the so-called constitutional revolution. Well, unlike the three-fifths clause of the United States Constitution, the basic law on human dignity and freedom is still very much alive, as are those parts of the Declaration of Independence whose aspirational content point in a very different direction from the Knesset's 2018 legislation. Also, these existing sources of liberal interpretation have created a body of law that cannot easily be waved away when the practical implications of the nation state law are up for consideration. The Adala petition is replete with references to the racist character of the contested law. There may, be, there may very well be a plausible argument to be made for just such a characterization. Perhaps, though, as part of, a, of the dialogical course of action that I am suggesting, it might be prudent when an appropriate case arises to emphasize, at least during the initial round of adjudication, the vagueness and ambiguity in the law rather than its worst propensities. Is there not some reason to hope that the expansiveness of the justices who gave a broad reading of the earlier basic laws to enlarge the scope of dignity jurisprudence may have made it easier for today's justices to exercise their own discretion narrowly to confine the reach of a very different agenda? If, as Justice Barak has written, the goal of judicial interpretation is to achieve unity and constitutional harmony, even judges who do not share his liberal priorities might be inclined to at least partially accommodate themselves to what he has wrought. 
Consider what, by most accounts, if not all, is the most controversial and divisive part of the basic law, Section 7. The provision that views the development of Jewish settlement as a national value and encourages the state to promote the establishment and strengthening, it promote its establishment and strengthening. The Adala petition singles out this section for particular condemnation, saying that it constitutionally entrenches racial discrimination. It invokes the sad history of South Africa, raising the specter of apartheid. And it finds the law to be a blatant repudiation of the principle of equality enunciated in the landmark Ka'aden decision, as well as an unambiguous nullification of its holding on matters relating to the issue of settlement, land allocation, and housing. I won't be so presumptuous to offer a strong opinion about an issue whose complexity I have not come close to mastering, except to say this. The champions of the law are no doubt hopeful that it will be held to permit racial or ethnic segregation. But the words of the provision do not explicitly say or allow this. When Justice Barak found in Ka'aden that the state's allocation of land to its, to its citizens on ascriptive grounds was prohibited by the principle of equality, he derived his conclusion from the values inherent in both the Jewish and democratic character of Israel. Among the hostile reactions to that ruling, was to call it a blow to the Zionist ideal of a Jewish state and to denounce its implicit rejection of a specific Jewish identity. Much like Brown versus Board of Education, whose reasoning the court had used and cited in its opinion, the ruling was followed by legislative efforts to nullify the judgment. When this failed, the opponents decided that the best way to safeguard Jewish identity was to entrench their noxious ideology in fundamental law. But why accept the claim that after 18 years, this entrenchment effort is now a fait accompli? Why, for that matter, should we have thought that Justice Barak's equality principle which is nowhere inscribed in the basic law on human dignity, had by judicial declaration become securely established as a basic norm of Israeli constitutional identity. From the perspective of hindsight, is it not arguable that his opinion prematurely proclaimed a constitutional norm that was and remains deeply contestable? I don't know. What I do know is that the decision in that case became much as will surely happen after the ruling in a future case testing the meaning and scope of the 2018 basic law, an integral part of the necessary public discourse about national identity that always precedes the actual formation of a constitutional identity. Knowing this, I would strongly argue for a more cautious engagement with the court regarding the subject of constitutional identity. And to, a channel, and to channel a justly renowned American jurist, learned hand, this much I think I know, that a society so riven that the spirit of moderation is gone, no court can save that a society where that spirit flourishes, no court need save. That in a society which evades its responsibility by thrusting upon the courts the nurture of that spirit, that spirit in the end will perish. Thank you.
Well, obviously, the nation state uh, law is a fundamentally a conspiracy aimed at making the life of one Jacobson tonight, this evening, much easier than that of the other one. So, uh, uh, I would say two things. I would start with two observations that, in my view, the nation state law is an extremely nasty piece of legislation. I think nasty is the, uh, the, the most correct term that I can use. It is really an outrageous piece of work. And, uh, and since I have uh, spent a lot of time in the past 20 years in comparing the Israeli constitutional definition as a Jewish state with other identitarian definitions in other constitutions, I can testify, I think, no less than anyone else, that while, in my view, the definition of Israel as a Jewish state fundamentally is compatible with international norms, and you can find uh, relative, uh, relevant parallels in, uh, dem in indisputably democratic and liberal states to that, this particular way of defining Israel as a Jewish state, as it is enshrined in the nation state uh, uh, law, is completely without parallel in the democratic world, and I suspect in the undemocratic world either. I think that the uh, constitution of Pakistan is more liberal uh, than the nation state. Uh, not, the, not the regime in Pakistan is more liberal than Israeli, but the, con the text of the constitution of Pakistan is is more reasonable in this respect. And, by the way, the constitution legislated by Mr. Or the Orban's new constitution of Hungary is, is, a, is much better as a text than, the, than the, this new nation state uh, uh, bill, uh, while Hungary is not more liberal than Israel, whatever, whatever affinity uh, Mr. Netanyahu may have with uh, Mr. Orban, the Hungarian police, uh, among other things, does not really carry uh, investigations into uh, the prime minister and does not recommend his uh, indictment, among other things, but, um, and in many other respects. But if you read the text of the Hungarian, the identity provisions of the Hungarian constitution, they are much better than the nation state bill. So it is an outrageous piece of work. Secondly, I think that the Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court, has no authority, has no legal authority to annul it. It doesn't. It's not, I mean, these are really two different questions, although lawyers very often refuse to distinguish between them, whether I like the law or whether I have a legal authority to overrule it. They don't. The courts, constitutional courts, and the Israeli Supreme Court is, in this sense, a constitutional court, interpret constitutions that don't write a constitution. And in those countries where the courts have assumed this authority, which, as you have pointed out, is the highest, the most aggressive form of judicial activism, the text of the Constitution includes provisions that at least can be interpreted in this way as giving them this authority. So they are basically following the Constitution. When the German Constitution says the human dignity is un untouchable, cannot be... Uh, cannot be violated, then, well, it might be claimed that this also applies to the constitutional power itself. And also in India, there are some basic uh, uh, principles. By the way, one of the basic principles of Indian constitution that cannot be changed is that India is a socialist state. Uh, one of the principles, uh, independence, secularism, democracy, the unity of India, which is very relevant to people in Kashmir, that do not recognize the unity of India and socialism. Now, I don't want to argue about socialism because I was born in a socialist state, so I may be not very objective on that. But, uh, you know, uh, this shows that really an attempt to entrench an ideological point in a constitution is not a very good idea in any case, beyond protecting human rights, which is, you can call it ideology, but anything else uh, has symbolic, may have symbolic power, but, you know, uh, India, okay, socialism is a, is a principle that cannot be violated by any power in India. If Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, is a socialist, 
then I guess that uh, Hanin Zoabe is a, is, a, is a Zionist, is a strong supporter of the Jewish state, no less than that. I don't think there is any difference between his commitment to socialism and her commitment to uh, the Jewish state. So it really uh, just shows that it is really a vain effort to say that we have a prin ideological principle that we will write in the Constitution, and then if the political system does not wish to be that, then it will be forced to be that. Because obviously the, the Indian political system does not wish to have a socialist state, so they don't have it. But that's just an aside. So, I, so in Israel there is no such power, there is no pretext for claiming it. The court lacks this power and should not try to justify those who claim, and this is what the anti-Supreme Court critics have always said, that when the Supreme Court interprets the Israeli constitution, that's the, the basic laws, it is actually writing them. They say it, the court should not now justify this claim by assuming an authority that it doesn't have. My prediction is that the court will not do that, will not allow, allow the, uh, uh, the, an, annul the law, nor will it rule, unfortunately, to my regret that it lacks the power, because judges hate to say we do not have the power. They, are really, they find it very difficult to pronounce these words. Uh, what they will say, it is unnecessary to consider this extreme uh, nuclear option of invalidating a basic law because actually there is no legal contradiction between equality and uh, anything in that law, no legal contradiction, including this um, outrageous uh, 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 phrase about mentioning Jewish settlement without, while refusing to say, as the, the Israeli Declaration of Dependence says, developing the country for the good of all its inhabitants. No equality, no good of all its inhabitants, just Jewish settlement. No, on the face of it, yeah, you might, you might claim. It's not unreasonable to claim that this is the literal uh, meaning of the words. There is no chance that the Israeli Supreme Court will interpret it in this way. What the Israeli Supreme Court will regard as a violation of equality, what it will regard, maybe there are some people here who think that what it regards is, as a violation of equality is not sufficiently radical, and others think that it is too radical. But what the Supreme Court believes violates what the Supreme Court regards as the principle, the right interpretation of principle of civic equality, it will invalidate, including anything in this field. And by the way, you don't have to ask Mr. Barak, because the representatives of the Attorney General have told the Knesset committee that legislated this law. Don't think for a moment that this formula will allow you to establish settlements that are, that are for Jews only. It would not be legal under this law. Nothing in this law will be interpreted in this way. By the way, they wanted to write this uh, explicitly, and then they had to give up because what they wanted to write explicitly is not Jewish settlements, but settlements according to national identity. Then they were told that that would mean that any group has a right to uh, establish settlements according to identity, not just Jews, and this, that means that in principle Arabs, Arabs' rights are not violated, but the, the Russians' rights are violated because they don't belong to either. The, 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 uh, the Russian immigrants who are not officially Jewish are neither Jewish nor Arab, so they would have to build settlements that are what, Russian, uh, Ukrainian, so it's, a, it's an episode, so they had to abandon this. But the phrase as it is is outrageous because a constitution cannot say anything like that, certainly not without adding. I think it should not have been, in any case shouldn't be there, but certainly you cannot say it without guaranteeing civic equality and that the, that the uh, state policy is for the benefit of all the inhabitants. It is outrageous, it is insulting, and it is completely inoperative uh, as far as the uh, jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Now, I want to uh, emphasize that I am not being, I am not saying there is no danger. Of course there is a danger. If they appoint judges, if they appoint justices who will be willing, who will, be, uh, who will want to interpret uh, uh, the, the legal situation in a discriminatory way, they will, of course, do it, of course. But, by the way, any judge could have done it without this law on the basis of the Jewish and democratic definition of the state. If you want to interpret the Jewish character of the state in a discriminatory way, they could have done it before this law. So there is no, there is no difference in this way. Legally, the Supreme Court has ruled for decades that there is no contradiction between civil equality and the Jewish character of the state. And as you mentioned, they also ruled that the 
a violation of, of ethnic equality is a violation both of the democratic and of the Jewish character of state. That means legally. I don't want to have an ideological argument. I will have it shortly, but not at... This is the, this is the case law of the Supreme Court. This is the law as it stands now. Now, that means that if you make the state ten times more Jewish, you are not making it thereby any less democratic. You may think ideologically that this is what you are doing, but legally, as long as you say these things are not contradictory, actually they, are, they go together. Actually, if you follow them, uh, if you follow them literally, you, would, you could claim that it is, uh, because, because the court has said that discrimination al also uh, offends against the Jewish state. So if you make the Jewish state, you make state more Jewish, then you arguably you can make it more democratic. But I will leave that. It, certainly you don't, don't make it less democratic as far as the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court goes. So anything that the court will find, and I don't think it's very easy to uh, appoint judges who will rule. You appoint judges and they don't exactly rule according to your expectations. It has been the American experience. It has been already the experience with at least some of the judges appointed by this, by, under this government. But I'm not, I'm not saying that we'll not, now they want to change the mode of appointment. They might do things in the future. I'm not saying there is no danger. But even if there is a danger, what they will do, they will appoint judges who will interpret equality in a more conservative way. None of them will ever say, even if they do it in a way that I will find objectionable, they will, not, they will never say they are allowing discrimination on the grounds of the Jewish character of state. They, they, okay, they will never say that. So as a matter of law, that balance will not be violated. I hope it will also not be violated in practice. Now, so if that is so, what is so wrong with, this, with the law? Well, the law is, because I'm really saying, I'm insisting on, I really believe that it is, does not change anything when it comes to the, to the legal principle of equality. By the way, it is true that the uh, um, um, human dignity basic law does not, of course, mention equality. It should have mentioned equality, or there should have been another article expressly providing for equality. But the fact that equality in Israel is a constitutional norm via human dignity has one aspect that we don't, there is no, the word equality doesn't appear. But the other side of this coin is that human is a civic equality is enshrined in human dignity, which you could say raises civic equality into the most fundamental, one, certainly one of the most fundamental moral principles. This is the, the Human dignity is the thing that the German constitution puts above anything. All earthly power and derives from God, ideologically. And so, so okay, so as long as, so, yeah, I would have liked equality to be there in the uh, human um, dignity law, and it should have been, it, it, it is outrageous that it was not mentioned in the, in the nation state law, and I will go back to it. But legally, the interpretation is very strong. The, by, by, by reading it into human dignity, you are not really, and you are not putting it down, you are in some way putting it up. Moreover, the, legit, the public legitimacy for this reading of the uh, human dignity law is stronger than ever after the passage of this law for the simple reason that the defenders of the law, the initiators of this law, justified their refusal, their outrageous refusal to mention equality in the nation state law by claiming that there is no problem. All rights, including equality, are already defended via the, um, uh, the um, uh, human dignity, uh, freedom, human freedom and, dig and uh, dignity law. They claim that all civic rights are already defended by that law. We are now talking about the Jewish state. Don't change the subject. That was the whole argument. Now, it is an out, not just wrong, but an outrageous argument. I will shortly address it. But as far as it goes, once all the representatives of the Israeli right are on record of saying that civic rights, including equality, are sufficiently protected by the basic law on human freedom and dignity, by logic, it means that they cannot really claim that, it is not, that they are not protected by, human, by, by that basic law. 
They have considered the argument. That was a manipulation, but no, but, but I don't think that you can seriously claim now that this used to be a controversial interpretation. It is no longer controversial after the passage of this law. Now, why is it then outrageous and not just bad? Why is it outrageous that they have refused to mention civic equality in the Jewish nation state law? Now, a Jewish state is an ideological concept. And as with any ideological concept, it is not surprising that there are very different interpretations, not just different, but conflict interpretations. And in arguments about it, it is very often the case that, that you are not sure, and I know this from experience, you argue with someone, are you really disagreeing on the substance of the issue or on the wording, on how you understand the word? Reminding me of a of a Jewish joke that a Jew, a religious Jew, a Hasid comes to a rabbi and says, Rabbi, a horrible thing happened to me. I lost my faith. I don't, I don't believe in God anymore. And the rabbi said, don't worry. The God in whom you don't believe, I don't believe in him either. So the Jewish state in which some people don't believe, I don't believe in it either, but I certainly very strongly believe it in other ways. So the, the Jewish state, the term Jewish state, I think, basically means either of the two things, and in its present form, they now they've used the term a state of the Jewish people. I think it's basically the same, but the law says that Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people. Now, what does, it, what does this of mean? The of, this is the most interesting word, not the Jewish people. Jewish people, nobody knows exactly what it is and doesn't matter at all. Nobody knows exactly what any people is or are. That shouldn't matter at all. Peoples have a right, peoples have a right to self-determination whether or not you can say exactly what they are. It's, it's, a, it's a completely meaningless <laughs> argument. But what does it mean to say that the state is of the Jewish people? The, right, the legitimate uh, interpretation, in my view, is that it, it is a state that gives the Jewish people its national independence implements its right to self-determination, turns it from a people without a state, a stateless people, into a people that enjoy national dependence. And this is the meaning of the term in the Israeli Declaration of Dependence. The Israeli Declaration of Dependence, prior to talking about <coughs> civil equality and prior to offering Israeli Arab citizens full and equal citizenship, says relates the Jewish history as it is perceived in Zionist narrative, then uh, mentions the... Uh, um, the partition resolution of the UN then says the final uh, phrase it is a natural right of the Jewish people to be like all other peoples masters of their own fate in their own state in their own sovereign state so it is a universal norm that they acknowledge as a universal norm and naturally they're interested in implementing this norm applying this norm to the Jewish people okay so that is a meaning that is, in my view, legitimate. And moreover, I think that denying it is a violation of equality. And it is not a theoretical question. It is denied. It has always been denied. It's still denied. Now, in a state that gives independence to a certain people, naturally, almost always, there will be people and citizens who belong to another people. If you claim that all the citizens of the state are one people, then you solve the problem. But if you have a national minority, a group of people who say, no, we don't belong to your people, we belong to another people. And that is an option, and this is exactly how Jews and Arabs regard their identity. If in a state that gives national dependence to a certain people, there is a considerable number of people who belong to an who have another people with another national identity, then, of course, the state is also theirs. It is also theirs. If it is not also theirs, they are not real citizens. If they are not real citizens, the state is not a democracy. It is hardly a state. It is a tribe. It is an armed tribe. It is a fundamental character of the state, and certainly of a democratic state, that it is a state of all its citizens. And at the same time, if it is a national state with a national minority, it is a, is there is an official, openly declared attachment between the state and the certain peoplehood whose national identity the state expresses. This is one, interpret one way of understanding the concept of a Jewish state or, or any other national state in a country in which there are national minorities. The other quite possible way to read this expression is to say that if the state is of the Jewish people, then it is a common property of the Jews. 
it is a it is a thing owned in common by the Jews and only by the Jews. Yeah? It's a common property of the Jews and of nobody else. Then, if it if the state is owned by the Jews and only by the Jews, then if you don't belong to the Jewish people, you have no share in the state. Then the state is not yours. That means that you may have all kinds of rights, that, but you are not fundamentally, the state is fundamentally not yours. Now, the nation state law does not say it in so many words, but if you read the text, it is obvious, it is clear, there can be no doubt, that the whole atmosphere, the tone that makes the music, the whole atmosphere, the ideological assumption of the nation state law is the state is owned by the Jews and only by the Jews. Others have rights, this is written elsewhere. Okay, this is, this is what, and they use this expression, personal rights. They speak about personal rights. Citizenship and civic equality is not only a personal right. Tourists also have personal rights. Guests have personal rights. Every human being, and arguably today you say not only human beings, have personal rights, but a citizenship in a democracy is an equal share in the nation, in the state, in, in the state is an equal share, and, and nothing else is enough. And so when you say the state is only ours and we respect civic equality, you con there is a contradiction. There is a contradiction. And so the writing an ideological definition of the Jewish state in a way that refuses to mention any other group of citizens, and of course not the main majority, means that you adopt an interpretation of the Jewish state, which is in fact the interpretation of Jewish state, has, that has always been supported by those who oppose the Jewish state ideologically, and by the extreme right, that the non-extreme right up to now has not openly adopted. But there, is, there can be no mistake about it. And so while I argued many times that this is not the right interpretation of the Jewish state, that it is not the interpretation of the Jewish state that is written in the Israeli Declaration of Independence, that it is not the interpretation of the Jewish state written in the basic laws of the 90s. It is. It has now been adopted by the Knesset, yes. So that, that therefore, it is outrageous. And of course, of course, ideologically, it's a present to, a, to every oppo ev any opponent, any ideolo every ideological opponent of the Jewish state in Israel and outside. And why are Israel, Israel's Arab citizens hurt by this uh, law w w instead of celebrating <laughs> that, uh, the fact that tactically, yeah, it's, there is a case to be made for saying that you have admitted what we have been claiming all the time, that this is what you understand by the Jewish state. Well, they are offended because they, I think the, the truth is that, and I'm very glad that the truth is, that they are emotional attitude to the state, not just a matter of, of accepting what is more convenient now and, and what is even worse than the state of Israel. There are plenty of things in this neighborhood that are worse than the state of Israel, but there is something deeper. I think there is a, the emotional attitude to the state is ambiguous. I'm not saying it's only positive. That could not be positive. But it is not only negative and strange. And I think there is a... Re the, the, the real feeling of offense, of course, it's very easy to speak about the Druze, of course, who are offended, but also the non-Druze Arab, Arab minority in Israel is offended because I think it, the great majority of it generally wants to be part of, of the state and is offended by the fact that the state has formulated its identity in this offensive way. Now, having since they have done that, I can tell you a story. I was having a cup of coffee with one of the guys who was the, one of the activists who were supporting this law. You know, in the Knesset, everybody, everybody are friends, including people who are, you know, Jews, Arabs, you know, people who say horrible things to each other. In the Knesset cafeteria, we're all friends. So I was having a cup of coffee with this guy, and he said to me, they, meaning Israeli Arabs, should know that this is not their home. This state, this country, this state is not their home. They law by each other. I said, what? And he said, not their national home. So he, he decided that that's too much. I said, Yo, th these are two very different things. Every national minority knows that it is a national home of another people. But to say that it's not their home, of course, that it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to say. No, no, so he walked it back. But the truth, if you want to know, is that that is the, that is the intention. Of course, it cannot be openly 
a word. But this is the, the emotional background. Then he said to me, if you say that Arabic is an official, is a second official language, you are making it into a national home. I said, no. If the two languages are equal, then you are making it a binational state, which is a national home of two peoples. That's right. If you say that Hebrew is the main official language or the main state language and Arabic is the second official language, which has been the status quo, what you are, you are not making Israel to a binational state. You are saying there is a large Arab national minority whose language the state respects, whom and whose language the state wants to respect. And if you don't want to say that, you are saying that you don't want to respect it. And this is a difference. But I think there is a point there, because I think that for him to say that Arabic is official means not only that Arabic is official, but that the Israeli officiality is in some way also Arabic. So to, to the word official means that th there is an Arab cultural element in the identity of the state. They don't care. They, they are not trying. They are not trying to harm the status of Arabic as spoken by Arabs. They don't, they don't, want, to, uh, they don't want to assimilate Arabs, as you know. But they want to say that the state as such is 100% Jewish. Not mainly Jewish, is 100% Jewish. And others have personal rights. This is what they want to say. By the way, by the way, uh, legally, by the way, they have done nothing because, and you know, this is how laws are legislated. They say Hebrew is the um, state language and Arabic has a special status. This is, what they, this is how they started. Then they added, they had to add, because there was, within the coalition there was some opposition to it. Then they added a provision that says nothing in this law uh, will uh, infringe the actual rights given to Arabic language or the actual standing of Arab, Arabic language on the eve of the, before the passage of this law. So the status quo is not, uh, so all, anything that Arabic has, it will continue to have. But we refuse to say, we, we refuse to call it second official language. So the legislator, speaking of legislative intent, and lawyers, all, they use this expression, which is, of course, half, half mythological. The legislator had two intents, two intentions. One was to harm the status of Arabic, and the second was to pretend that they don't want to harm the status of Arabic. The problem is that the second intent they put in the text of the law so I think that when it comes to the Supreme Court, while I don't believe they have any, any business annulling the law, they can say honestly, honestly, I think it is a reasonable interpretation, at least as reasonable as the other one, to say that what does it mean, the standing of, standing of the legal, the actual, uh, before, the status actually afforded to Arabic on the eve of the passage of this law. Does it mean that they will count the number of signs and will say there will be no less, this, the number will not fall? No, no. Legally, the actually obtaining standing of the Arabic language is as it is in the case law of the Supreme Court. This is for any lawyer. There, the standing of Arabic that will not be affected is as it is what it was, as it was formulated in the case law of the Supreme Court. And since the definition of Arabic as a second official language is, is not in the, in the mandatory law, it, the, it speaks about two languages, doesn't mention second or first. Of course, in Israel, Hebrew is the first, and I think it should be the first. But the court, the Supreme Court, has ruled that Arabic is the second official language. I think they will say not only that there is no practical damage to the status of Arabic, I think, or at least I hope, and I think there is a very good case for saying, that Arabic is still the second official language even under the passage of this law, with the difference that this is not enshrined in the basic law. So if the Knesset wants now to legislate against it, they can do it. It's not protected by the, the status of Hebrew as a state language is protected by, this, by the basic law, whereas Arabic can, the status of Arabic can be lowered, but until they do it, which they will never do. The language of the law is it, it, as it is, I think, should be taken to mean not only that there is no practical damage to, to the status of Arabic, but that Arabic is still recognized now as it was officially recognized on the eve of the passage of this law as the second official language. So now that they have, so this is nastiness for the purpose of being nasty. And I, I said that I was invited, I took part in the 
deliberations. I was not, uh, Ruti Gabison was invited, but she didn't want to do that. She, so she offered me as a substitute, so they invited me. And I told them, this is the interpretation of the law. You are doing, this is an insult. And now it is better not to insult people, and it is better not to insult peoples and groups and communities. But you know, if you want to insult someone, at least you should have a practical benefit from it. If you don't have any practical benefit, and you just insult for the sake of insulting, it is a more grievous insult. So this is what it is, a pure insult. What should be done at this moment? I think that before the passage of this law, the general formula, Jewish and democratic state, was, it was very general. And I think that we argued about what it means and what should mean it or should not mean, but it was basically very compatible with the interpretation that I offered as a, a state embodying the independence, national dependence of the Jewish people, and democratic means democratic. Now that they have written this interpretation of the Jewish state into the basic law, we cannot uh, now be satisfied with a general definition. And the right course is, well, you can say repeal the law, but there is no hope for that. The law now has to be amended by putting in it expressly in the basic law on, on the Jewish. It should have been, of course, a Jewish democratic state or the natural. Uh, Jewish state should, model, should not be the only thing in the, in the uh, title of the law. There should be a law on the nature of the state or on the Jewish democratic state. And the law should, I think, say explicitly, should not be shy about saying that the state of Israel is an embodiment of the national dependence of the Jewish people. And it, sh it should also say that the state of Israel is a democracy and the state of Israel respects equality of its citizens. Benny Begin offered an amendment of the law that was a very modest one. <coughs> it is an outrage that he refused to uh, adopt it. He said, he proposed saying Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people respecting the rights of all, of all its citizens. Now, I think the aim should be to say more than he suggested, to say more. And I think that we should follow exactly the examples of those, not many, but there are countries that have adopted in their, that's my, my last point. There are several countries that have actually adopted in their constitutions, formulations that are very similar to the term Jewish state or Jewish nation state. Most democratic states do not have any such statement, which does not mean that they are neutral, culturally or nationally neutral. Most states are not culturally and nationally neutral, and many of them are not culturally and nationally neutral to a very, very blatant extent. But the reason why most states do not say we are a state of a certain people who are a majority is because they don't want to, uh, to acknowledge that the minority and the majority do not belong to the same people. They want to believe or to pretend that they believe that all the citizens of the state are one people. Now, that has an inclusive aspect, as it is in France, uh, although uh, the French secularism has not only an inclusive aspect, but in principle, that is an idea that, of course, all citizens are, of course, the French nation. And there can be no other no notion of nationhood that does not include all citizens. But in a country like Greece, whose constitution is very strongly ethno-national and religious, they don't, the Greek people allegedly includes the Turkish-speaking Muslim community in Greece, because they don't want to recognize as a national minority. So Turks, Greek Turks are supposed to be Greek. That's not a, that's not a very great gift to them, I'm afraid, because there isn't a single, you know, people who know Greece know that there isn't actually, there aren't many Greeks who belong, uh, Turks are Greeks, and not, not many Turks who believe that Turks are Greeks. They're citizens of the Greek Republic, but under the Greek constitution, it doesn't say that, they, that Greece is attached to the Greek people as opposed to somebody else, because all citizens are Greek people. What they do in, a, in countries like that is they claim that there is one peoplehood, but they then endow the state with the cultural qualities of the majority. So they start a constitution within the name of the Holy Trinity. Not only that, they demand that the president of the republic takes his oath of office should be in the name of the Holy Trinity. Okay, that is a, this is what the religious parties suggested when the state was established and Ben-Gurion refused to write. They wanted the state president to be Jewish as a formal um, expression of uh, Jewishness. So 
the Greek, and of course there is the status of the church and the connection with the Greek ethnic diaspora, so, and, and the cross on the flag of the state. So Greece is in no way a neutral state, but it does not say that the state belongs to the majority as opposed to a minority because they're supposed to be one people. But there are some states that explicitly recognize that there is a peoplehood that the peoplehood of the majority and there are significant groups who, who belong to other identities. And they want to say that the state is a state of the majority people. And so how do you prevent the interpretation of this of to be that this is an exclusive property of only the majority people, which means that the minority are guests or tourists or something like that. They put this, they say what the, the classical example is the constitution of Croatia. It is a very national and very, it is a very national state with very nationalistic history with a recent bloody horrible national conflict. And I'm not at all sure that it is nicer to be a Serb in Croatia than an Arab in Israel, frankly speaking. I haven't checked it, but I'm not completely convinced of it. But the constitution of Croatia was written by civilized people who wanted to be part of the, to be accepted into the European community. So they, so they wrote it as a constitution of a democratic national state should be written. So it says that Croatia is a national state of the Croatian people and a state of its national minorities, then it gives a long list of national minorities, including the Jews, sorry. They have decided against Azmi Bishara, the famous argument about whether the Jews are only religion or a nationality. They recognize the Jews as a, there are maybe a hundred Jews in Croatia, but they have recognized us as a nationality. In any case, Croatia is a national state of the Croatian people and of its national minorities with a, a state, not a national state, a state. The national is only, and it is a state, it is a home of its national minorities with a, with a full list. And all other citizens, if you are a foreigner who marry, has married a nice Croatian girl, you are neither this nor that, but then you are citizens of Croatia, you are, this country is yours, who enjoy full civic equality with people of Croatian nationality, nationality me, meaning in Croatia exactly what it means here, ethno-national affiliation. So the state is, says that it is attached to the Croatian empire, to the Croatian peoplehood, and also says all the other things it means. Don't think for a moment that because Croatia is a country of the Croatian people, it is not all, also a country of a state of all its other citizens. And there are similar, similar formulations. You can, can take it five centimeters to the, to, the le to the left or to the right, but this is a principle. And I think the right, thing now to, the right thing now to insist on is to say, okay, we take this definition and we add to it, not just civic equality, but an explicit statement that the state of Israel is a common home, common homeland to all its citizens and specifically to the Arab minority. I think it is important uh, 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 for the same reason that the framers of the Israeli Declaration of Independence having committed themselves to civic equality, then addressed the Arab community specifically by name. Because as we know, this is the overwhelming majority of the non-Jewish citizens of the state of Israel. This is what should now be the aim of those who want to this country to conform to basic democratic liberal norms. Thank you very much.
any any law, any constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means. And you know, the French secularism as interpreted by certain people is a very offensive thing against the Muslim minority, but it's, it's the same word. And the Constitution of Canada says that Canada is based on principles that acknowledges the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Now, if you read the text, you know, if, if you write this in Hebrew, it's the supremacy of God, basically, or maybe even in Arabic, but we know that the Canadian God is a nice guy. I'm not even sure it's a guy anymore. So, uh, in, in Canada's jurisdiction, this phrase does not mean any violation of, of anything. Okay, So, yeah, it all boils down to how the court, well, I'm not saying the court will not be that. If they wrote into the law, they could, can write into, they could write into the law, they could have written to the law, but it's difficult to write it to the They try to say that the Jewish character of the state is above all other, any other law. They, there was a supremacy clause that said that any, any provision of any law has to be interpreted in the light of this provision. Now, I told them, all the world will, all the world will read this as saying that the Jewish state is above democracy and equality. All the world, except the Israeli Supreme Court, who will say, of course, whatever violates the Jewish state has to receive. But since, as we know, neither democracy nor equality, nor your duty to pay taxes or serve in the army, is in any way contrary to the Jewish state, therefore. They didn't say it's above the, the equality. They said above any law. So even that would not have uh, done it. The only way to legalize discrimination is to write in the law. There is, we do not respect equality, or equality doesn't apply to Arabs, or equality does not apply to non-Jews. Yeah, well, you read that, yeah. If you write this into the law, then it will do the thing. But it's, they cannot yet re write it on the official uh, paper of the Knesset. Not now. That's the point. Gary, I, I have a question for you. Um, I mean, you you are actually offering us uh, an interpretation that uh, uh, establishes ambiguity uh, as, a, as the best strategy possible uh, to deal with uh, the uh, fact that we are talking about uh, um, a, a, a divided society, not only between Jews and, and Palestinians, but also uh, uh, among the Jews themselves. There are different uh, uh, ideological uh, streams that uh, would like to take the state where else. Don't you think that this is uh, an option that doesn't exist anymore based on your reading the Israeli reality? And that we are actually going into a constitutional revolution that is directing or taking us in a direction that uh, any, any ambiguity that could compromise the exclusive interpretation of Ca the Israeli state. Excuse me? Counter revolution. Constitutional counter Well, yeah, well, it's a revolution, and yeah, it, it is. But anyways, uh, no, I'm not using counter-revolution because I don't think the, 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 the basic laws of 1992 were a revolution. But anyways, uh, uh, so taking us in a, into a situation where uh, the majority, the growing majority in is inside Israel will not uh, allow uh, uh, the ambiguity you're looking for because it could be interpreted as if Israel is also the state of another people, or not exclusively the state of the Jewish people. Don't you think it's too late in your reading of, uh, of, uh, of Israeli uh, society, the Israeli, uh, Israeli politics? And uh, uh, don't you think that the, uh, the, the uh, uh, nation state basic law is an indication of this process? It's not the end of it. It's actually an indication is a turning point in a, in a process that is going to continue. Because the ambiguity you're talking about, or the constitutional identity, the open constitutional uh, uh, identity you're talking about, was actually entrenched in the Declaration of Independence and in the rulings of the court so far. And what Alex said, actually, is goes in this direction. But the, the, the nation state law, that's why maybe for him it's outrageous. <coughs> I, it, it, for me, it's also outrageous, for, but for different reasons. Another reason that was not mentioned, I'll mention it in a minute, but so, so it's a 
turning point. It, it re it's a revolution in a direction that will close up the ambiguity that was given uh, so far, which for me, and here my another statement I would like your opinion about, is that actually this ambiguity was a veil in order to allow inequality on the practical level without being accused of stating it constitutionally. And Alex said that many people, you know, many, many opponents of Israel or critics of Israel became very happy uh, that the law passed in order to say, here, this is Israel. Uh, so uh, what, 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 used to, what we used to have is, is that uh, uh, the ambiguity veiled actually a reality that, that is, uh, is, is problematic. Uh, so far. And the last, last point, you did not mention whatsoever neither you nor Alex, you know, the fact that uh, there are two and a half million Palestinians living under Israeli law, Israeli rule, without any civic rights, as if Israel is only within the green line. This Israel doesn't exist for 52 years. <coughs> so what, what Israel are you talking about? Well, I'm, I'm talking about different Israels. Uh, and, <coughs> and my three responses actually reflected alternative uh, vision. So, in fact, uh, the ambiguity uh, argument is what I was pushing in the third account, which is to say, let's keep open the question um, of the possibility of, of uh, inclusion through judicial interpretation, given the textual ambiguities or at least openness within, within the law. And uh, the best one could hope for is some, some kind of reconciliation between the uh, 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 earlier interpretation from the 90s and what might be forthcoming from this, uh, flowing from, from, from this law. Because as you uh, uh, are implying, in fact, the ambiguities are such that, you know, Barack uh, reconciled the commitment to a Jewish and a democratic state always by defining Judaism on such a level of abstraction that it was possible to accommodate most people's understanding of what democracy uh, democracy requires. Uh, the reverse is possible too. You can define democracy in uh, the most procedural of terms uh, to allow a majority then to establish effectively, as you are saying, the reality on the ground that we have a Jewish, uh, a Jewish state uh, experienced in that way by the different groups uh, within it. So that's all possible. Now, again, I was giving different scenarios. Uh, the second one of which uh, you may recall, which is the one that asks for some uh, hesitation pushing too hard on the constitutional identity uh, question uh, because uh, once that door is open, you may not be pleased if he walks through precisely because you may be right. <laughs> we are at that point where the likely entrant uh, through that opening uh, will be somebody or some uh, um, uh, ruling uh, that uh, uh, entrenches much more profoundly than the text itself, a version of this new reality that you're suggesting, which is why I am somewhat reluctant uh, to invite uh, uh, the judges, not knowing where things are going, to uh, adopt uh, that perspective. Uh, now, my first argument, uh, which was uh, perhaps it didn't, uh, uh, it wasn't received in this way, was intended to be in a way the most provocative in that it embraces what I take to be an implicit radicalness of the critique uh, that is to be found in the, uh, in the petition to the court, uh, which is uh, suggestive of, well, uh, what are we talking about a constitutional revolution here? Uh, there's there's uh, uh, very little in this law, and I take what you say seriously, that symbolically, and the word of can be uh, uh, given 
great significance, but in fact that those are radical critiques of the Zionist project uh, would say that what's happening now is just one increment beyond uh, what uh, uh, a quote that I offer from Ben Gurion was suggesting about uh, the, the law of uh, the, the law of return. He also uh, said that about civic equality. Yes. And it is not given to the state; it is it exists out there. Right. He said it about the right of return, right and about civic equality. So that could continue. Okay. okay. So uh, yeah, I. I, I understand what you're saying about ambiguity being a, a uh, <coughs> an historical phenomenon which is now being uh, less recognizable given the political trends, uh, but it's precisely those political trends which it seems to me any strategic invocation of constitutional identity must, uh, must take seriously. And that's the thrust of what I was, uh, of what I was arguing. Large, largely in sympathy uh, with what Alex was saying uh, about uh, the, 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 the truly bad, true, true, true badness uh, of this of this legislation, but the fact of its badness uh, should not conceal the kind of prudent way of approaching uh, approaching. Now, uh, you're, you're, uh, you said that uh, this law will not be repealed. Well, it's not entrenched. The majority can. Uh, can in fact uh, change it. But what you're advocating as an addition to the law would in all practical, for all practical purposes be a repeal of the law because it would be unrecognizable in that sense. So it would mean what you said it means and uh, no reason to question your, your judgment. Uh, what you're proposing uh, would in practical, in practical effect be of one interpretation of what you do is say it is an affirmation of another. But yeah, it is a, it is a <laughs> revolution in terms of interpretation, but that, that's the main argument, what it means. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I, I really did want to, to emphasize uh, the textual issue because so much is made of it, particularly in the, in the profession petition. I really don't think uh, one should inadvertently hand a gift those who have proposed this law by saying that what they have done, they actually did. Mm -hmm. When they say they entrenched this constitutional identity, the substance of which Alex has beautifully uh, described, uh, that at least should remain a contestable point in light of the sort of tension within the, uh, the historic Israeli, Israeli tradition, tensions that include the legal interpretation for the basic law from the 90s, as well as the old jurisprudence of the Declaration of Independence. And that still remains, and that should be put into some uh, uh, legal contestation with the interpretive renderings of this movement. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, from a uh, lawyer's point of view, uh, stress that I think, uh, frankly, all those petitions, uh, which I, I read all of them, Filed in the Supreme Court, uh, neither anticipates the nullification of the basic law. They're all an attempt to uh, extract from the court the best possible interpretation of the uh, basic law. So I think that, uh, you know, <laughs> your critique. We expect to nullify, actually. Yeah. 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 But that yeah. does expect to nullify. <laughs> I don't think you expect, you want to. I don't think you expect. But we're hopeful. Yeah. 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 Different yeah. people can also expect different. is going to be speaking tomorrow, so uh, <coughs> I'm going to hear, hear what, you, what you have to say. I cannot hear tomorrow. tomorrow. Well, but last comments. I have a short question. Yes, yes please. Yes. Uh, for, for Alex. Yes. Thank you.
אתה רוצה להגיב לה לפני? תגיד לה. יש לי רק שאלה שאני רוצה להגיד. אני יודע שזה מאוד מאוד, אבל זה מה שאני אומר. כשאתה מדבר על דברים על הגרון, כמובן לדברים על הגרון, אני חושב שהפרוסס על הגרון היה בשנים האחרונות, בשנים האחרונות, that this state is becoming more of a state of its Arab citizens rather than less, in practice, even under this government. We all know that it is very important things are happening. There is nasty exclusionary rhetoric, and I'm not, and I'm not saying it's just words. Constitution is not just words. It's a creed of the nation. But on the ground, other things are happening, and you know what? Also symbolically, when, if you take a ride in the light trade in Jerusalem, and you pay attention to the relations between the Hebrew and Arabic language within that system, you might think you are in Brussels. You might think they're in Brussels because it is the Arabic, it's not just, it is there, it is not the second official language, but it's fully qualified for the language. Now, I'm not saying it's all over equally, but it, that, that was never the case anywhere. <coughs> in in twi- when I came to this country in the 70s, they, it was under labor, they would never have written anything like that in the, in the basic law. There could never be a transport system in the state of Israel in which Arabic would enjoy the same status as it enjoys now in the <coughs> Jerusalem light train. Okay, so it's not the end of story, but it is an interesting aspect. So I, th- I hope that this reality on the ground, and not just because the government and the judiciary and the bureaucrats are learning some things, including what is good for the Israeli economy, but because the Arab citizens are making it more of a state of the citizens. More of because they are taking some things into their own hands, and so the number of Arab students, and Arab students, Arab girl students at Technion in, the, in all other universities is growing rapidly. That is also, and we, we all know they are the presence of Arabs in professions, in medical profession, and in, in other fields. So in various senses, the actual process on the ground, I think, is going in the right direction. And, and, but on the other hand, unless, in the end, in the end, unless we solve the problem that you mentioned, that we have no time to discuss. If we assume that Israel will swallow up the territories forever and that there will never be a partition, then all this will not help because there will then in the end, not tomorrow, but in the end there will certainly no Israel. There will be, in my view, no state of Israel in the end. And so all this, this will be ancient history, which is my main academic field. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gary, would you like to comment? No, it's okay. It's okay? Uh, first, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I think, first, uh, first and foremost, I think you're uh, being a little bit uh, uh, too optimistic because in, uh, uh, especially in this uh, election campaign, we have uh, came to realize that no political actor sees uh, the Arabs as a legitimate uh, 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 citizens here. So there, is, there, there may be an improvement in economic and social status. It is not by no means to translate it to the political uh, uh, status. This is uh, my first comment. A question to you. Uh, you, 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 you do, you, both of you firmly uh, accept the notion that this is, uh, this is first and foremost a symbolic question. A constitution is a, a codification of what Bourdieu calls uh, principles of vision and division, a master a schema for, for, for the whole uh, society. However, you, uh, both, of, uh, both of your uh, lectures are, are strictly uh, structuralist, uh, and it is reduced only to the logic of the structure without referring to the phenomenological aspect of the notion. That is, Arabs do not, if you say to the uh, 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 Arab-Palestinian minority, a Jewish state can be uh, 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 theoretically uh, uh, equal to them, they do not feel that in the eyes of the subject in the field, a Jewish state, in either, in, 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 it, is, it doesn't matter what model will be uh, this Jewishness, Jewishness uh, is, is, is felt, is accepted, is understood as a Jewish superiority. And so don't you supremacy. think, uh, supremacy. supremacy. So uh, we have to acknowledge or, uh, or to focus more on the uh, 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 on the subject on the field, how he, and not only the, uh, the lawyer, the judge, the structure itself, how he understands the, log- uh, the, uh, the logic of the structure uh, 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 as, a, as a master well, I scheme. Have, I have to say, uh, I, I, I think, at least in my first response, I was uh, acknowledging the 
precisely what you're what you're saying, which is uh, which is to say that the uh, change. Now, this is not necessarily what I'm my reading of the change, but I, I, I think this is something that uh, that is a meaningful part of the, of the constitutional politics of the moment. Is that uh, the change? From the pers from the radical perspective that I think is implicit in what your your phenomenological uh, argument says that that uh, what has occurred is is uh, uh, an extension of already what uh, existed that the state from its conception uh, uh, in, in, embeds uh, this uh, notion of superiority if not subjugation, and therefore one uh, uh, might see what has occurred not so much as a revolutionary uh, departure, uh, but simply a more uh, clarificatory uh, uh, effort uh, to, 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 to establish uh, in words the reality that is, 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 is um, part of the lived experience of that population. If that's what you're saying, it's consistent with, with, the, with, with the first uh, mm -hmm. uh, rendering that I, that, I, that, I, that I put out there, uh, which itself it may not be consistent <coughs> with the other two, but it's part of the conversation. I'm not my, my, uh, and it will be a very short comment. It wouldn't be easier to accept that the Arab Palestinians should be a part and parcel of any uh, writing of a constitution. And this uh, a procedural justice will yield uh, a constitution. Arab, member, Arab Palestinian members of the Knesset were very much part of it. They were a minority, but they were not, not part of it. They were taking part and saying uh, that they're outraged by the content of the law. Now, uh, of course, a majority is a majority. But I, I want to tell you that when you say that politics is one, that social and economic matters do not influence the political sphere, you don't have to be a dogmatic Marxist in order to uh, realize that social and economic matters in the long run tend to influence this big political sphere. Not immediately, not directly. By the way, even directly and immediately, Gantz has, has said that he wants to amend the national state. So he doesn't say how, and that there is a big question, but it's at least an open question. But in the long run, I think that what is happening in the education, in the economy, and in the social sphere, I think is bound to have political results. And on the question of the attitude of the Arab minority to the Jewish state, it's a complicated thing. I, I'm reading polls. I know that some people uh, say that I, uh, I, I like them too much. But the polls include contradictory messages. And this is, makes them, this is what makes them credible. Because if the polls <coughs> only included things that I like, then I would say, well, maybe people are just answering in a way to please the, uh, the establishment or whatever. But in the polls among the Arab minority of Israel, you, you, you have very strong statements against the Jewish state. The definition of Israel as Jewish state and even stronger against the Zionist state, even stronger, which is considered as a Jewish state with uh, aggravating circumstances, okay? But on the other hand, when you ask people, do we accept the phrase that the, the Jews in Israel, the Jews in Israel are a people that have a right to a state of their own? then there is a large majority that say yes. Now, whether there is a contradiction between denying the Jewish state and accepting that the Jews in Israel have a right to self-determination dependence, in my view, depends how we understand the Jewish state. But this phrase also appears, and all kinds of other things, including, by the way, until recently, mm -hmm. slightly more than 50%, I'm not a slightly more than 50% of people who say not that they support it, but they would vote in a referendum for the definition of Israel as a Jewish democratic state that guarantees civil equality. This majority has disappeared in the last two years because, thanks to the nation state bill, this is a great achievement of the nation state bill, but I think it can be reversed. I hope so. One, one, oh, uh, yes. one dose of reality uh, on, on the subtextual question. Um, yes, you can, you can put all the right words into the course, their, their uh, omission in uh, historical terms can be problematic. But there are some, I think it's the last count, 89 constitutions that, uh, 
that uh, have inscribed democracy uh, into their uh, text. And these include the range of states from France to Cuba, meaning whatever democracy might Well, I have a lot to say, but I'm not going to say anything anymore tonight. Okay. I would like to thank the audience uh, 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 to have come in this uh, uh, cold weather and rainy uh, atmosphere. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, both talks, you enjoyed the discussion, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a, a range of uh, speakers uh, speak about you know this topic, uh, and uh, uh, I wish you uh, a pleasant evening. Uh, I, and uh, tomorrow we're beginning at 10.30 in the morning. You are most uh, welcome to come and hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Good Thank night. you.